In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense. The Lord came out from my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory, of, of the, the immortal Lord, Father, Father, heavenly, Lord, holy, Lord, blessed Lord, Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, without your help, our labor is useless, and without your light, our search is in vain. Invigorate our study of your holy word, that by due diligence and right discernment, we may establish ourselves and others in your holy faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. All right, so uh, one thing I forgot to mention is uh, I did include, uh, I uploaded the, the video or slash audio of uh, our last class on the website. So if you did miss our uh, verses 1 to 14 of Deuteronomy 4, it's all uploaded. Uh, but be wary because it took us a while to get through verses 1 to 14, so there's two hours in one thing. So you may want to break it up sure. a little bit. So, <laughs> But we're going to continue today then in Deuteronomy chapter 4, uh, verses 15 uh, to 31. Hopefully we'll get that far. Um, because if you look at it, you could kind of break this up into a couple different sections, uh, verses 15 to 24, and then 20, verses 25 to 31. Um, so there's kind of two different sections, but uh, we'll see how far we get. If, now, if you remember, we are coming to the end here of uh, the first sermon in Deuteronomy, and this is a, a sermon that has really... Uh, focused on recalling the um, just the the acts of God in in bringing His people not only out of Egypt but then through the wilderness and to the uh, to the promised land, getting ready to go in. And if you remember, it has focused primarily on uh, God's faithfulness uh, throughout all of this and beating the kings of Sihon and Og and uh, of. Uh, coming through uh, various points of apostasy when the uh, children of Israel went their own way. But in, as the sermon comes to an end, it really turns to an exhorting kind of tone. So it's no longer just recounting history. Moses is, you can, again, kind of imagine it as a parent speaking to a, a college student going away to college. Right? Uh, I'm not going to be there to, to help you make all the right decisions don't be an idiot, right? Um, and that's kind of the tone. I mean, Moses has a, a, a very urgent kind of harsh tone that he takes with the people, and you're going to hear that that tone tonight. But it's a uh, it's a, an urgency in his tone because of the love that he has for them, and more importantly, the love that that Yahweh, that God has for them, and uh, and you'll hear that you'll hear that come through. So tonight, uh, if you just look, verses 15 to 24 uh, really does focus on uh, not forgetting uh, God, especially his prescriptions at Horeb or Sinai. And he spends a lot of time talking about idols, and we'll talk about that and talk about why. Um, and then verses, uh, the next part, verses uh, 25 to uh, 31 so a little bit of prophecy about uh, the scattering that's going to happen with the people, but just as importantly, the restoration that God is going to give in bringing them back together. So, you know, this is a, a, a little bit different kind of thing that happens at the end. But let's go ahead and begin with verses, let's just take 15 to 24 uh, and uh, in that first chunk. Uh, and again, listen for anything that jumps out at you anything that uh, catches your attention. Deuteronomy chapter 4, beginning at verse 15. 
Therefore, watch yourselves very carefully, since you saw no form on that day that the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the midst of the fire. Beware lest you act corruptly by making a carved image for yourselves in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the water under the earth. And beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the host of heaven, you be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them, things that the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. But the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace, out of Egypt, to be a people of his own inheritance as you are this day. Furthermore, the Lord was angry with me because of you, and he swore that I should not cross the Jordan, and that I should not enter the good land that the Lord your God is giving for you, you, giving you for an inheritance. For I must die in this land. I must not go over the Jordan. But you shall go over and take possession of that good land. Take care, lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make, make a carved image, the form of anything that the Lord your God has forbidden you. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Here ends the first part of the reading. All right. Well, maybe we'll just start with, again, kind of what, uh, what jumps out at you in that, that first section. Anything strike you as strange or odd? God, God has emotion. Jealous God, angry God, merciful God. And it's just something you, you don't think of right away. Yeah. yeah and, and I know some people have trouble with, especially that language of anger or, or jealous, right? Because uh, a lot of times we associate that in a very pejorative sense, right? But if you just take anger kind of at its root, I mean, what is anger, right? Anger is uh, a hatred of what is evil, right? Or at least kind of what is a perceived evil. <laughs> um, and for God's perception is always going to be right. So it's, 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 it's hatred towards what, that what is evil. Or jealousy, you can only be jealous if you love something, right? Uh, and so even that jealousy is is born out of God's righteousness and his true character, which is love. There's a, uh, I think I've mentioned this in class before, but we often talk about um, uh, God's alien work and his proper work. Does that ring a bell? Um, so when we talk about God's alien work and his proper work, what we mean by those terms is God's proper work is that which flows from his, who he is. You know, God is love. So when we think about God's proper work, it's being gracious, it's being merciful, it's forgiving, right? It's loving. His alien work are those things that we wouldn't necessarily associate with the true essence of God, but actually do seek to serve his proper, his proper work. So things like, uh, I'm angry with my people, and I'm going to send them into exile. That doesn't sound like that, you know, is coming from the God that we we know, or at least we think we know. But if you stop to think about it, what's the purpose behind exile? Discipline. Discipline. As a father disciplines children, right? So the whole point of exile is to bring about repentance so that people return to him. It's, it's image of father and, and children, right? Um, if you see, well, I guess people, parents don't do this as much anymore. Uh, but, you know, you see a father swatting the behind of his kid, right? Uh, you can look at that and say, oh, that's a, that's a, horrible, <laughs> a horrible act, right? Um, but done in a specific kind of context. You can, I guess, argue about child rearing technique or whatever, but uh, it's to serve a different, a different good, which is discipline and correction. Right? 
So we talk about that alien work as being something done. It's not who God is, but it is in service of his proper essence. So anger and jealousy, it almost sounds like we'd be a little hesitant to describe God that way, but that's actually, again, all stemming from his love and his care for his people. It seems to me, too, as you said, we cannot know God at this point in our lives. We can try to know God and be guided by his words. Mm -hmm. But who understands the essence of God? And God may look at us and may go, I need to put this in terms these guys can get. Mm -hmm. And so even jealousy and discipline and anger are referenced and attributed to God in order to make God more accessible to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a, a, a term that sometimes theologians use that we're anthropomorphizing God, mm -hmm. right? So we're ascribing to God very human things is just a way of helping them understand, right? Um, that's a, a kind of another way you could talk about it. Um, I, I do like the, the alien and proper work distinction because um, I think sometimes the tendency is, especially as Christians reading the Old Testament, we see these, what we see as acts of violence or, you know, God looking like he's kind of petty in places. It's like, no. That's what a father does. <laughs> a father sometimes has to discipline. A, a father sometimes ha gets angry, right? But it's not an anger out of hatred. It's not an anger out of, uh, you know, just kind of a maliciousness. It's out of love, right? He care for his people. I remember, no, I won't tell that story. It'll take far too long. But, um, so, yeah, so we have that the anger and the, and the jealous. Jealous nature of God. What else jumps out at you? So I was just curious how Moses uses um, the iron furnace mm. and that's a negative. He rescued them out of that, but then he ends this with God is a consuming fire. Yes. So we jump from one fire to another. I just is there <coughs> translation differences or is consuming fire pretty accurate? Well, there's let's start with the first one, the furnace. Because, again, this image is an interesting one to pick because it has a it has two sides to it. I mean, in one sense, it, you know, obviously he's re referring to Egypt, right? So that the pressure, the heat of that fire is the, the misery that they endured as, uh, as slaves in Egypt, right? But throughout the Old Testament, the furnace is also another kind of image. For refining. For refining, exactly. So there's kind of a, a dual... At least in that, in verse 20, there's kind of a dual thing going on. Um, the Lord has taken you, brought you out of the iron furnace, out of, out of Egypt, to be a people of his own inheritance as you are. Right? So even that misery of Egypt sought to serve the higher purpose that God had for his people, refining them, bringing them out. The other reference at the end is a really interesting one uh, for, uh, for Moses to use. For the Lord your God is a consuming <coughs> fire. Stop to think about when Moses was called, how did God make himself known to But But what was that, Peter? It, it was exactly, it was not a consuming, it didn't burn up. How did, how did God make his presence known to people in the wandering? Because of the fire, right? So there's this sense of, uh, it, it's almost like God's not going to change. But as, as in our sin, we're going to change our relationship to him. And so in, instead of being in his presence of a non-consuming fire that just makes known his presence, it's going to become consuming, right? Um, but it's, it's also a good image to get across the urgency of this. Do not take care. Don't fall away, because what we've seen as a, a symbol of God's presence and his power among us is going to consume us if we turn away from the covenant. Does that get it, kind of what you're yeah. looking at with that? I don't, I don't, again, they're kind of, both images have two sides to them, a, a kind of a gospel image to it and a law image to it, right? Jerry, go ahead.
Yeah. And yeah, appeared to them and didn't consume them there either, right? Yeah. yeah. So good, good. And and Moses, a preacher here, right? He's he's using an image to kind of form an inclusio at the beginning and end of that section. Peter, Betty, go ahead. Yeah, and, and I, I think that the language of feelings is is a, is tough it, it, because when we experience uh, feelings, I mean, we have all kinds of. I mean, there's all kinds of mixed emotions bound up in our feelings, right? And some of them can be good, some of them can be rather self or self selfish and, and self centered. I think the um, that language of jealousy um, and anger is really rooted back in what we looked at last week. Uh, take a look at, not last week, but uh, a couple weeks ago. Take a look at verse uh, verses 3 and 4. Remember we talked about this a couple weeks ago. It says, Your eyes have seen what the Lord did at Baal Peor. For the Lord your God destroyed from among you all the men who followed the Baal the Peor. And remember, we looked at that story from Numbers and what was going on in that story was uh, you had uh, actually Balaam who convinced the Israelites to go, um, I like the way the old King James puts it, whore after <laughs> the, uh, the temple prostitutes uh, of the Baal. And so you had these men who were having sex with the temple prostitutes, right? And they're all struck down. And then take a look at verse 4. It says, but you... Who held fast to the Lord your God are all still alive today. And that Hebrew word of holding fast, uh, if you remember, we looked at how that's used other places. It's used in Genesis 2, 24, when it talks about how a man holds fast to his wife, clings to his wife. So it's, it's a language of marital relationship. And in other places in the Old Testament, holding fast is not just you know, holding on to something. It, it implies that marital relationship. So when we get to down here where it says the Lord is jealous and he's angry, it's because idolatry is, is a form of spiritual adultery, right? As God's people, we belong to him. So anytime we sin, uh, it's, it's cheating on him. And as a, as a husband to his people, right? We ought to belong to him. And so he's that jealousy comes from a place of you are mine. You know, I have I have redeemed you, I have won you, you are mine, brought you out of Egypt. In a sense, what you're doing is is uh, spiritual adultery in, in all of that. So that's kind of I think a good way to couch these feelings of anger and jealousy. It's not just kind of out of being slighted. Um he actually has a claim on us that is real. Um, and it's not just in, in feeling, but in actual covenant language. But let's, let's kind of piggyback on that, Betty, because he spends a lot of time talking about idolatry and idols. And I'm just curious, I mean, one of the questions I asked you to think about was, uh, let's see, where was that? Why was Moses so elaborate in his prohibitions of idolatry? Why do you think 
I mean, he goes on for quite a few verses being very specific about uh, about idolatry. Why do you think he's so... They got burned with golden calves for one thing. All right. There's, there's been a precedent of, of, uh, of idolatry with the golden calf. Good. The first commandment and the effects of what happens when you fall away from it. Say that again. It's the first commandment and the effects of what happens when you fall away from it. Yeah. So it's, we're going to see just in the next chapter as Moses re reiterates the ten words. It's right at the beginning there. But also the effects of what's going to happen if you fall away. If you fall away, then what's going to happen? Uh, you're going to be consumed, right? So he knows the he knows the effects. Also think about where are they going? Yeah. You're going getting ready to go into the promised land. Remember, this is the parent talking to the college kid, right? You're going to go to a place. There's going to be a lot of stuff that you're going to have to watch out for. So you're going to go in the promised land. You're going to have all these different kinds of, uh, of gods that are, that are going to be there. And this is, I think, why we get the detail we do in verses 16 to 19. You don't make uh, any carved image for yourselves in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that's on the earth, the likeness of any winged bird that's in the air, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, the likeness of any fish, that's in the water under the earth. And if you think about the history of Israel um, in their time in Egypt, the Egyptian gods were largely personified by animals. So this is also probably a reference back to their time in, in Egypt of you had crocodiles and cats and eagles. And, yeah, those were all the Egyptian Egyptian gods. And then 19, and beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven and you see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the hosts of heavens, and be drawn away and bow down to them. Especially uh, in the Near East, that's always been the, uh, the temptation as well. But does this remind you of anything else? Genesis, it's all about creation. Yep, almost in that exact order, right? Kind of going through it. And so there is in this... Uh, so don't worship my creation. Yeah. There is this kind of don't get too, too full of yourself, right? There is always this temptation uh, to worship the creation over the creator, and that's what idolatry essentially is. This is um, Romans chapter one. Go ahead and flip to that real quick. This is the charge that uh, that Paul levels against all all people. I'll take a look at Romans chapter 1. It starts at verse 18. I'll just kind of read through this a little bit um, as we go through. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his power, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation in the world of the world in the things that have been made, so you are without excuse. And by the way, so this is uh, in Lutheran theology, and not just Lutherans, but um, I think most Christian denominations make this distinction one way or another. Uh, we sometimes talk about the book of Revelation, and I don't mean the last book of the Bible, but I mean all of Scripture. And then we talk about the book of creation, right? And so you can learn from creation. But Paul lays out what you can learn from creation. Power and God's nature, divine nature, right? What you can't learn about God in creation is forgiveness, right? And mercy. Because if you look at our world and just how it operates, it's a pretty unforgiving place, right? Um, but then he goes on, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were dark, darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Can you hear Deuteronomy 4, right? 
Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. There's something kind of interesting in, in all of this that, um, you know, we are created in the image of God, right? And part of being created in the image of God, uh, kind of historic Christianity has observed this, part of what that image might be is this need and this desire to worship something. And what happens in the garden is, who did we worship? Who did we set up as, a, as an idol to worship? Yeah. Ourselves. Yeah. Remember Satan's temptation? You will be like God, right? So kind of from part of what idolatry is, it's not even so much that we're setting something before God, like something else before God. We are setting ultimately ourselves before God. So that's why you have uh, idols that are made in the likeness and image of us, people, right? Um, and even if you go through the, the animals, right, the, all those things actually point to something back about ourselves. Um, another important thing to remember in all this talk about idolatry is the distinction that the catechism makes. You guys remember the distinction the catechism makes about idolatry, the two kinds of idolatry? Simple idolatry, which is like what he's describing here where you make an idol. Um, or actually, simple or gross idolatry, right? Where it's just kind of an idol. But there's also another kind of idolatry, idolatry where it's an idolatry of ideas or an idolatry of things. Remember what Luther says in his large catechism? What's the most dangerous idol in the world today? Money, right? Um, but your idol could be reputation. Your idol could be education. Your idol could be family, right? And as you stop to think about it, you know, all those all those kind of other idolatries, you know, again, it's just us. It's just us making an idol of ourselves and our wants and our desires and trying to shape God into what we want him to be. Okay. In an artist, this passage has always bothered me. Yeah. Don't make me, you know, nothing of any living thing, but we live in a cornucopia of images of living things and other things. And what I think, and I was looking here um, in the lesson where it's like, um, when you see heaven and blah, 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 all the hosts, sorry, God, um, and all the hosts of heaven, you be careful that you be drawn away and bound down to them and serve the things that the Lord, your God, has allowed to all people, right? That's, that's like the real danger isn't in the image or the item itself. The real, the, the, the real danger is our intent against those objects, worshiping selfies, worshiping... Um, you know, making something and say you have power, this made thing made by mortal hands. Mm -hmm. um, but would that be a, a reasonable way to look at it, that idolatry represents intent to give glory to something other than God, but the thing itself is not intrinsically wrong? Yes and no. And, and, and the yes part is this. I mean... Um, one, one thing you do see throughout uh, Scripture, you, see, you hear, see it in many kind of wonderful places in the Old Testament, that um, part of the critique that uh, the prophets give against idol idols is that they're, they're nothing. You know? Uh, you'll see the prophets making fun of, hey, go ask your idol a question, see if he, if he talks back to you. Right? Um, you know, and I think it's the prophet Isaiah who talks about when you worship these dumb idols, you're going to become just like them. You'll be hardened just like they are. You know, they're blocks of wood. You're going to be just like blocks of wood. 
um, it, there's an old dictum, you are what you worship. <laughs> and so if you worship things that are nothing, you're going to become nothing. Right? Um, and St. Paul picks that up too when he talks in Corinthians about food sacrificed to idols. And part of what he says there is, I mean, part of his argument is, yeah, go ahead and you can eat it. I mean, apart from Christ's defense, because there are no there are no other gods, right? Those those gods don't exist, right? Um, but there is another sense in which um, we don't talk about this very much, but it's it's true. I mean, there there is a sense in which the the Old Testament idols, uh, I think you could make an argument were uh, kind of mediums of the demonic too. Because for instance, I mean, you have for, like Pharaoh's magicians doing things, right? And Moses doesn't report it, report it as uh, they just did magic tricks and tricked them, right? That Moses, or I'm sorry, Pharaoh's magicians are actually doing something. They're having some kind of power. So you could also say uh, there may be cases where the idols actually are something. Um, but they're not gods, but they might be demonic. Right? I mean, if you have uh, Molech is one from the Old Testament. Uh, Molech is, uh, gets referred to uh, as the god that you would sacrifice children to. You could make an argument. That's, that's not nothing. That's demonic. But it's not nothing. Right? So kind of a yes and no to your question. Idols are nothing in them of themselves. Right? We as people invest in those idols, uh, have a, a way of trying to make a god that we want right? so that we can somehow justify ourselves. But there is also the supernatural. There is also the demonic realm here involved too. Does that make sense? So what about during their travels to the wilderness, the serpent on the stick. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Look to it. To be saved. To be saved. Well, you remember what happened to it? No. That's what I'm asking. Yeah. But Jerry and I were just talking about it. Jerry. What 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 happened to that? So there, there is that, there is that tension, right? Mm -hmm. Of this is the, this was the means that got appointed at that time to be used, right? Um, but even that became kind of dangerous because they ended up worshiping the created thing as opposed to the creator. Right? Well, we see that with crosses today too. Yeah. A lot of times people wear crosses as like talismans or something like that to show something off, rather than, and we worship that object rather than you know, that object of salvation mm -hmm. and knowing that we are saved through it. Yeah. People were really going to want to talk about the demons on the way up. I think it's true, though, right? I mean, there's something going on there. When you look, it's not just... <sighs> yeah. Yeah. But, and, and kind of going, and just a, a little kind of church history lesson, too, this became a very live debate in the early church about images. This is another thing Jared and I are talking about today. Um, but there was a, a debate uh, that, that, that happened, and in, uh, in the early church was actually pretty opposed to images, um, too. And it, there was a debate a little bit later. It's kind of called the iconoclast controversy. And um, uh, the church basically, and I think, I like art, so I think they're right, um, that because Christ is the image of the invisible God, as Scripture teaches, right? We can, in fact, make images. Uh, again, not for worship, not to worship the image, but as a, as a way of kind of pointing beyond itself to the Creator. Uh, and there has always been kind of that tension in the church about <laughs> that fine line between uh, using art as a way of proclaiming the gospel, uh, as a way of teaching people, and a more superstitious kind of use of those images or statues or things like that. Yeah. 
trying to put you back in in sense and in back. You know, if the object itself is intended to have power of its own in some way. I mean, we went to Tibet and we went to the Tower Palace and they had a, a Dalai Lama who died young and so their answer was they made a room and they were going to accommodate like 10,000 images of, of Buddha and if they made enough, then the next uh, Dalai Lama wouldn't die. Mm -hmm. They just had to keep making enough Buddhas because if, if he died, they didn't get enough Buddhas made in his lifetime. So, you know, that's you know, talk, talk about twisting your head. Yeah. You know, it's like, you really believe Not relics, the real truth. Mm. Yeah. Relics, uh, it was not just a matter of relics. Um, so the question for those who, um, like, what about relics? Um, yeah, like, yeah. a specific kind of question about, like... Well, idols, I mean, they, they, they're close. I mean, they're just close to yeah. yeah. Cause well, because they, they, they had the relic in there. Right, but and it was it was kind of it was a money make. There were some wonderful yeah. lines that there were more. If you took all the splinters from the cross, you could have made like a hundred crosses <laughs> in, in Europe, or you know, you could have rebuilt John the Baptist you know, fifty times over from all the the bones that were found, and supposedly from John. Um, yeah, I mean that's probably a good example of. Something that could actually have a fairly, you know, because having a relic, for instance, I mean, that should, it could communicate something very powerful. Um, you know, taking the, the events of the Bible and making them real, right? And the reminder that these are historical things that God acts in history. And that, those can be really powerful reminders. It's when it's the, the kind of the, 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 the line that Luther would take is when, the use of those things go contrary to just God's word. So, for instance, um, even with something like Holy Communion, where we would say this is certainly a sacred thing, right? It's made hallowed by by God's word. You know, Luther saw in his own time people trying to sneak away with the host uh, so they could feed it to their cattle to cure disease, or you know, burying it in their house. Or, you know. Now. Are they wrong? Are those people wrong in seeing this as a holy thing? No, it's a holy thing. Um, are they wrong in how they're using it? Yes, because what does Christ say? Take in, eat. He doesn't say take it and feed it to your cattle. He doesn't say take it and bury it in your house. Right? So the kind of the, the dividing line would be in how we're using an image or how we're how we're attending to a relic. Does it point us to or away from God's word and the revelation he's given us in scripture? That would be kind of the, the litmus test, right? Does that make sense? One place we went, they had a full body relic and they had a cloth and they had a window over the face with the cloth and there were people lined up 150 feet behind and constantly they would go in, they would bow, they would kiss the glass over the relic's face, the saint's face, and they would go on praying. And that really bothered me. Yeah. Well, and it bothered Luther. I mean, Luther has made one trip to Rome in his life, and um, it wasn't a good experience, <laughs> uh, as he saw, you know, people essentially being swindled out of money, um, as he saw... As he, as he saw it kind of very crassly put, you know, if you do X, Y, Z... You know, go kiss this relic, then that is a, a type of propitiation made for time in purgatory, right? Those things all go. Peter is spectacular. It is. It is. <laughs> it is. They spent that money well. Um, very well. But, um, but yeah, just kind of, and not just art, but, you know, music, architecture, all of it can serve an incredibly powerful thing in pointing to the the beauty and the transcendence of God. It's when the focus gets lost and we focus on the created thing as opposed to what it's pointing to that it really gets problematic. Oh, I'm sorry. Jack and Sharon, go ahead.
Yeah. Yeah. And it's going to come right, right in the next chapter. He's going to hit right back at, the, at, at idolatry, right? Because that's going to be the, that's going to be the temptation. And we shouldn't fool ourselves into thinking, oh, we don't have idol, we don't have statues, we're fine. Right? We just have we have much more subtle idols today. Um, and if you don't think that you know images and, and can be idolatrous, um, I don't want to start a political debate, so please don't take it that way. But look at what happens if our flag is treated a certain way. What kind of emotions does that rouse in people, right? Um, positive or negative. Um, so we're not any better than these people. This just happened to be the, the way that that idolatry would get manifested in those, in the carving of images. We have our own ways of doing it today, right? So one thing I wanted to draw your attention to too is take a look at verses 21 to 22. Um, once again, Moses brings it up again. Why does Moses blame Israel for his sin again? Why do you, what do you think the point is of him bringing it up again? He sounds a little better than me. Yeah. Because of you, I'm not getting Well, and, and I think I think you have to also connect it with what's going on in this whole discussion about idolatry, right? The whole kind of what you do with idolatry is you're trying to make a god in to your own liking, yeah. right? And this is kind of the ultimate example of our god is free and he does whatever he pleases, right? Uh, so even me, you know, his prophet. Uh, I don't get any special treatment. I don't have any special sway, right? God will do what he wants to do. He's not like an idol. Um, he's not beholden to you. Uh, and so here's an example of it, right? Um, I'm not going to get in. I think that's kind of the, the thrust of that little reminder. that He's going to be left out because of the sin of the people. With the anger... Oh. Go ahead. With the anger... Just that, that he didn't get to go in, or I mean, what do you think it's like to be the source of God's anger and causing that anger? Is it more than that than just, I don't get to go in? He's angry with me, so I don't get to go in, or was, did he get a talking to, or I mean, well, and, and I and I wouldn't even say, I, I, he doesn't, I don't know if he's even stressing the anger here uh, in the sense of like um, the punishment. I think. Part of the point is um, he is not bound by us, right? He is free to act according to his righteousness and his his word, which means um, I'm not getting in, right? Remember, anger is always for God. Anger is different right. than our kind of anger. God's anger is always the rejection, the revulsion against sin, against evil. Right? So it's righteous in that sense. Um, so I think that's kind of the point, right? God acts according and is faithful to, to his word, which means that even here, he's angry with me because I sinned against. Now, you guys caused me to do it, but, but he's, being, he's being true to his, his word. Is this the first they heard of that, that he was going to get to go in? No. no, he's brought it up. Yeah. I always think of it as he's warning his people. Yeah. And he says, even I, the prophet of God, if I disobey God, I'm held accountable. Yeah. So, and even, so you, the lesser, not being the prophet, will still have to Exactly. A solid, solid warning. God is going to be faithful to his word. Which is why in verse 23, what's the next, the words that starts off 43? Take care lest you forget, right? And that forgetfulness is not just, oh, I don't remember what happened. It is uh, that kind of spiritual <coughs> forgetfulness of chasing after, after other gods. Gary, you were going to... I think, I think 
was Peter and Betty. Yeah, that is a good point, Peter. Yes, and, and you're going to get that too at the end of, uh, we're not going to get there tonight, but uh, at the end of verse 31, that again, uh, just take a look, I guess, we'll, since we're coming to the end. It's good to end on a gospel note, not just always a law. Um, um, but take a look at verses, uh, oh, 28. Let's just kind of read through this very quickly. And so he's talking about how they're going to go in uh, and how uh, they're going to be scattered, right? This is all, this is all prophecy of, of the exile and, and all that. Um, and there you will serve gods of wood and stone, the work of human hands that neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. Um, just, I love that way, especially when you think about the incarnation, right? Uh, all these idols that can't do any of that. And what do we have in Jesus Christ? A God who can see and hear, eat, smell, Really cool. Uh, but from there you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him. If you search after him with all your heart, with all your soul. And it's not their, their seeking that's really miraculous. It's the fact that it's the nearness of God. That's the gospel, right? And when you are in tribulation, all these things will come upon you in the latter days. You will return to the Lord your God and obey his voice. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. and He will not leave you or destroy you or forget the covenant with your fathers that he has swore to them. So the same faithfulness that makes God angry with Moses, the same faithfulness that's going to lead to the restoration uh, at the end. God is faithful and he will do it. Just at the time, his faithfulness might not feel the best. <laughs> uh, but it's it's working towards his, his good purposes. Well, good. So anything anything else you want to touch base uh, or anything else you want to cover on verses uh, up to 24, 15 to 24? Maybe your, part of your homework for next week is think about the idolatry that we have today. What are the idols that you see out there in the world? Maybe come see if you can narrow it down to the top three. And so you think it's, you know, you look at uh, in the Old Testament or in the ancient world, how they'd have rooms full of gods, you know. Um, I think we, if we came up with an image for every one of our idols, we'd probably be able to fill those shelves pretty quick, too. Ooh, I mean, there's a lot of hip. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Anything else? Have you Googled it so uh, yeah. you have the correct answer? Yeah. I'll put it in chat, GPT. <laughs> <laughs> have you guys seen this yet? Who's Tyler even putting it? So there's the, an, an, an AI. Yeah, right. There's an AI program called Chat GPT where you can ask it to do just about Long anything. Wrestling. Yeah. Pass the Wharton. Um, yeah. PA. Yeah. They pass all the med, all the med tests. Mm -hmm. It's med pretty wild. Things. You can just type a little thing, say, I mean, something silly. Write a song about Deuteronomy chapter 4. We want to do it right now. Okay. It'll freak people out. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> oh, my God. So. Let's say let's write a country western. Oh, uh, write a country western song. That's 
Uh, chat GPT, write a country western song about Deuteronomy before. <laughs> okay, you ready? Yeah. So here's the song. We'll sing this on Sunday. Ready? I mean, it's it's printing this as we're talking. So this is a country western song based on our reading for tonight. Riding through the desert with the wind in my hair, the word of the Lord burning right, burning bright in my care. Deuteronomy four. It's a verse I hold true. A reminder to always keep God's commandments too. Don't turn away from the path that's been laid. Deuteronomy 4, it's a promise God made. The Lord is our guide as we journey on. Through the highs and lows, he'll never be gone. We're warned not to worship any idols of stone to keep the Lord's teaching as our own. The Lord is the only one we should ever obey. Deuteronomy 4, it's a truth we must stay. Is there actually a tune to that? You can ask it. There's like a code. Yeah. What is it again? Yeah. Chat, the last verse, Deuteronomy 4, it's a verse to live by, a reminder of the Lord and a path not to shy. So let's keep the commandments and follow his way. Deuteronomy 4, it's the only true way. Oh my gosh, that is so Isn't cool. that wild? I think a yippee ki yay at the end. <laughs> I can't believe that. Well, they're doing the art. Children's best. What was it again? Yeah, seriously. Chat, what? Chat. And then the letters G P as in piano T. Thank you for doing that. I didn't really believe it for two minutes. No. Oh, it's oh, it's wild. My new digits. AI is truly truly frightening. And you want to talk about the idols of the world? Just now. Down the road. So let's do something far more productive and end with prayer. Yeah. Um. But yeah, please remember in your prayers, gosh, Chris and Nina and Ronnie, uh, Linda's family, um, the Strikers and Nina had testing done yesterday. Um, Debbie Lukey, who's gonna have surgery upcoming. Ashley, she's recovering. Lehia, I'm gonna remember that it's in my calendar now. But we got a lot of folks and Diana, she continues her testing. Yes, I'm, I continue to think of the key of safety as a Exploring mysteries. <laughs> Nobody can figure out what's going on. Something's going on, but you know, I just you go in, it's like we can rule these eight things out, but then we have to add these six. You know, so we'll see. We're all in good time. All right. Well, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand, and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thank Thanks be to God. God. Have a good night, everybody. Feel free to take cookies, guys. Good night. Pastor, what were the Central Lands? Uh, at least that's what you're telling us. Yeah, fine and gross. Fine and gross. They're really gross as well. Yeah, it is. Fine you want Plato? If you take six, don't take six. No, I don't want that. And that's in the catechism, the small catechism? It used to be. It used to be in the old one that I learned. Uh, they they may, I, I know they have it. Well, we uh, may have raised the music. If she's not Peter Zion, yeah. Peter Zion. But then lots of things can be really good. I'm going to use everything together. I'll send you. Yeah, I'm um, in there. Here we go. Send a newsletter. Where's Ross? Just hand me the.
I got a sack. All right. I got that. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And we go to the Thomas and I were messing around with it the other day. <laughs> How you guys doing? Good. Good. Hey. Is that new in the back? Is that, or is that your bike? Your lip? Ah. All right. Hey, I apologize. I got to head out to a meeting. Right. Yeah, love you. I sent you a broken. We did a rub.